Welcome to another episode of Money for Nothing, the podcast about music and capitalism. I'm Saxon Baird with Sam Becker, as always. And today we got a little interview for you from Kristen Robinson doing the good, the good work over at Billboard, tackling uh, online copyright infringement fraud involving uh, low-level scammers out of Arizona, millions in cash, and a green Lambo. Medium level, medium level scam. Yeah, medium scammers, level. Yeah, I yeah. Would say. Yeah. Medium level scammers. Um, it's a great interview. Uh, you're going to hear that um, in the second half. Pretty dope story, actually. Pretty interesting. Like, I know when you say like online copyright infringement fraud, people probably like you know their eyes roll back and they fall out of their chair. But um, yeah, like this is actually a pretty pretty cool story, and I feel like very contemporary and probably something we're going to see a lot of actually. This story gives us a peek. The story um, of these scammers and the way that they stole millions of dollars in copyrights from from some of the biggest artists in the world and the ways in which and some less less big artists and and the ways in which they were able to get away with it and the kind of total opacity of this system and the rights mechanisms that structure it it provides like a really interesting angle into the kind of um the granular details of something that can be so abstract so much, right? Yeah. It lets you see the different parts of the system moving and moving in a way that, that we're like, who wins and who loses in these systems? Um, a lot of times it's not about like the ostensible logic of these systems. It's about the like, it's about the messy realities on the ground. You know, this story gave so much insight into like our weird not just digital, but like platform mediated reality and not the platforms we think about like YouTube, though YouTube is very much in this, but platforms we don't think about like the middleman companies that YouTube hires to deal with its copyright issues, as well as the kind of like (laughs) in pot, like, you know, like the impossibility of like getting someone on the phone in a lot of these settings. So I thought it was an absolutely fascinating story. And so that's at the, the abstract intellectual level. Like the very real, very honest level is I was on Twitter.com something like six months ago. And uh, Kristen had kind of just reported out this story, uh, which is really, uh, was, like I said, it's a fabulous piece and everyone should go and check it out. We can link to it in the show notes. Um she she kind of sent out a tweet that was like, man, I really want to like talk more about the dynamics of copy digital copyright payments. And I saw that and was like, <laughs> I know a place where you could talk more mm. about the dynamics of digital. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> hello. <laughs> and so I reached out um, and was like, if you want to go long on this, like, let's go. Let's do it. <laughs> um, and was uh, very glad that I did. Yeah, I really, like, I really like that point about the sort of the the, win- the winners and the losers. And I think it also kind of speaks to like how these tech companies have completely transformed our world. You know, I think about something like, say, like Uber or Lyft and how now we're all relying on it. And it kind of like has hurt public transportation or say like the cabs in New York City. And so we all become reliant on it. And then all of a sudden these companies, because they're not making a profit, like or for whatever reason, like have to shift. And it affects people adversely because now we're all reliant on it. Or just want to shift. Yeah. Or, or just, just want, want to shift. shift, right, exactly. And I think the interesting thing, like, that it's not quite the case with YouTube, but, like, what is interesting is that it's become a sort of necessity if we want to, like, watch videos and, like, maybe listen to music that's, like, not on other streaming platforms or, like, that we can't obtain from our local record store anymore. And so it, it's interesting that, like, the people that are getting adversely affected by this are the people that are actually using it because they kind of almost are forced to use it in a sense or it becomes, like, a, like a, a sort of requirement if you want to, like, get your music out there. And the reality of it is, is that the tech company like doesn't really give a fuck about them or us. And so when something like uh, copyright infringement happens and someone's basically stealing millions of dollars of someone else's cash uh, royalties, then you would ex- you would expect that maybe like the company would actually care and like make an effort. But as you'll see, as you'll hear in the interview, like YouTube like didn't care or like didn't have the systems in place and like. I don't know. It's kind of like a mix of like sort of neg- negligence and also just like that's not where their that's not where their attention is. But unfortunately, like our systems have been, our world has been changed in a way where like we're all using this, and so you kind of want the checks and balances to be there, and they're just not because it's a private company. I don't know, <laughs> and like that's well, profit driven. I, I think it's. I don't know. I, I think it's. 
I think it's a little bit more than just that, right? Like, like I think you're right that 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 and as we'll discuss further, like YouTube really didn't care, right? YouTube's paying out money; it doesn't affect YouTube's bottom bottom. Yeah, line. exactly. They don't care about whether someone's stealing someone else's money, but I mean, a couple things that that, that are complicated there. I mean, for one, I think and like the PR won't hurt them. Yeah, it doesn't matter. But they're they're too big. But but I mean, I guess three things that that come out of what you just said and one is about the ways that these companies are able to reshape the world and in particular um and me and Kristen talk about this a fair bit is, is the assumption kind of built into the legal structure of the internet kind of these uh safe harbor laws right that the websites are not legally responsible for websites that host user generated content aren't legally responsible for much if not all of of any potential harmful stuff within very strict limits and that as a result (laughs) companies like youtube are able to just um put you know change the rights structures right and change the right structure so that basically it's on rights holders to make sure that they're getting their money from their music being on these websites rather than the websites like making sure it's okay to yeah post this music and and the only way i would say is like uh if i like if i'm an author it's not usually like my responsibility the assumption is that someone is not pirating my work right like and i can sue them if they do the assumption is not that it's on me to go and claim the money that's being collected from everyone pirating my work, right? That it's totally okay yeah, it's for people totally to publish that's... any version of, I don't know, Harry Potter that they want. So but... in J.K. Roll, so basically what you're saying is that like when uh, J.K. Rowling can go and collect her millions of dollars so she can sit back and uh, spout like not, uh, anti-trans nonsense online, uh, like – she doesn't have to go and collect that herself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not, I'm not allowed to publish a version of Harry Potter that, yeah, she's able to collect money for her nefarious purposes for. She's the only one who's allowed to publish them. Right, and it's it's it's, it's totally absurd to think that like we you know like like an author wouldn't get wouldn't get paid unless they like asked to get paid <laughs> and like had to like go into like send you know send an email or go into some sort of system or like you know it's totally totally and absurd so, so that's one thing and the other thing i wanted to pull out from what you said is is kind of in in what you're saying you kind of mix back and forth i think between users and the potential harms to them from the fact that there's no real recourse to these websites and i guess like two maybe, maybe two different classes of users like end users who have no real recourse to these websites and the artists or musicians whose whose work or video creators whose work is being put up on them, right? And I mean, there is this thing where I, I do think it's a complicated argument, but it wouldn't surprise me if in the long run, the kind of economic devastation that like we're seeing for, for a whole host of, of kind of like mid-tier musicians out there um, or at least economic challenges for a whole host of mid-tier musicians out there um, doesn't in the long run hurt those users. But it is, I think, a, a, like a sticky truth that in the short term, there is this sense, and YouTube is very actually nimble about positioning it this way, where in a weird way, some of these copyright claims can pit artists against listeners with or against video creators um, with kind of YouTube on the side of its end users who it's selling advertisements to against the artists who are like basically <laughs> being depicted as, as a uh, like no fun party poopers who are like all about like miss stopping the internet from being free man. But there is this tricky thing where in our current system in, in, in the now that those two groups are kind of pit against each other. And, um, Figuring out how to get out of that impasse when there's a third party who's able to extract so much value and information from everyone is complicated, which kind of leads to that third point, which is which is just that that in the way all of this was set up and, and in their ability to reshape the world, there was this kind of, I would say, like huge land grab by youtube basically and i'm doing research for this episode uh 
and, th- and I think some of the stuff that was that was maybe discovered by some of the folks who who have been suing YouTube for this. There were some amazing memos I found online that uh, were basically like folks at Google talking about the idea of purchasing YouTube. And they're basically like, we shouldn't purchase YouTube. It's all pirated material. Doesn't that break? Don't be evil. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Um, Yeah, which for anybody who's read Surveillance Capitalism was like the original sort of um, way in which the uh, founders of Google started like started out um and then they realized that hey we can we can make money i remember that that was like <laughs> they changed it in like 20 like 12 or something i mean it started it start it's, it's it started, it started earlier than that but like yeah i mean oh maybe... no, no i'm just saying like the the phrase don't be evil was around i remember when they dropped it off i'm like oh i guess we're we're just being evil now <laughs> i mean they've been they i mean i read surveillance capitalism and they, they, it, it's revealed that they were already being evil <laughs> but yeah i hear what you're um, saying <laughs> But there is a thing, right? Where, 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 and that's one of these things about um, one of the dynamics of scale that 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 um, that these companies function with, right? Where it's a whole bunch of small relationships that they're mediating, um, but they're able to sell advertising against the bulk of them and make a huge amount of money doing that. And so, you know, there, there's this kind of dark irony where, sure, these guys may have been the biggest indie scammers in youtube history but the biggest copyright infringement scam in youtube history is probably youtube (laughs) like they made (laughs) billions of dollars in unclaimed royalty payments that just kind of gets baked into the way the world functions and what we do about that i don't know and maybe there's no use crying over spilt milk at this point but but it is important to remember like how we got to where we where where we are and what these companies used to build these massive positions that then allowed them, for instance, to gen you know, YouTube's not Uber in that YouTube is genuinely profitable, right? But w- w- what did they have to do to get there? And as we know, it was like a lot of copyright infringement. Yeah, and and also like I think it's important to look to where we're going as well. And if, like I kind of see this. I mean, it's probably as you'll hear in the interview there's a big question mark around like how much this has actually already happened and it probably will continue to happen and that's because when you have like a massive privatized corporation which is supposed to sort of police itself on this kind of stuff well it's just not going to happen the money's going to go elsewhere not into the department that's supposed to be paying attention about like you know the checks and balances of whether or not people who are claiming uh copyright or claiming royalties off of you know in their uh cms uh whether or not that's actually them yeah, I feel like in a way, we'll probably see this also like in other other industries as well and probably already have where you just kind of you have these like privatized corporations, you know, obviously trying to make as much profit as possible and people get affected by it in negative ways because the company it's put on the company to like uh, pol- police this kind of it's put on the company to sort of put in the systems to make sure that people are getting paid fairly and they're just not gonna. They're just not gonna do it, and, and they're not gonna do it because if they put it in really straight, right? If if YouTube turned up it, the it's dial them. on right. non copyright infringement, it would, let's say, you know, even if it was pretty good. A it would kick off a bunch of edge cases, and um, you know, maybe kick off people who aren't actually infringing, and it would hassle a lot of users and produce a lot of bad press, and that does kind of get back into that this this moment where like. You know, I stream stuff off of YouTube and don't think that hard about whether it infringes someone's copyright. And there, there's a, you know, that's a, a societal problem that we're going to have to deal with. I mean, thinking about going forward and, and me and Kristen kind of ended the interview on this and you'll hear us talk about it like just a little bit, um, you know, or a big question on in terms of like also there's the, the where's the next land grab? I mean, it's being decided in court almost as we speak, but a big potential land grab are these large language models that are being trained against huge swaths of the internet, you know, to the point where (laughs) there's an amazing, um, so it's trained off these huge swaths of the internet, much of which are copyright to the point where in certain scenes that are highly associated with images, with the Getty images watermark, the AI will actually reproduce a version of the watermark because it thinks it's part of the image. That's amazing. <laughs> but, so how is that the land grab though? Oh, because it's it's taking this right. It's it's copyright infringement 
from certain perspectives and you know trying to with all due respect the fact that um a lot of really smart people have a lot of really different visions on how this is all going to work and how this is going to shake out and I'm, I'm by no means understand this space well enough to 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 really speak to it in any kind of universal sense but like from certain perspectives the amount of money that some of these models are going to make by being trained on uncompensated content from a huge host of users and none of those people are going to get paid but the people the, the model is going to make a business a ton of money yeah right? so so what you're saying is like there's this whole that's a land grab in my mind yeah the, kind of like how the, how the concept of streaming and like its relation to like royalties and like what people should earn it's like people who are whose intellectual property that these machine learning systems are like are basing themselves off you're saying that people should get like basically like compensated for that well i'm saying that yeah or or that that you know if if i think it's a, it's, it's an open point of debate right but if we're thinking about where the money is going to go if you train a large machine model on a sorry large language model on a huge swath of data and then that model makes a lot of money do the people who produced the data that it was trained on that allowed it to do the things it does should they should they get paid and i mean i don't know at a moral question i don't know an ethical question i don't know at a at an economic level right like what's better for the future of the world i do know however that if they're not paid if pretty strict legal structures kind of like the legal structures where and i cannot believe i'm lauding them but like the original copyright laws that were passed at the beginning of the 20th century it's really bad if i'm lauding those copyright laws but if you don't get some sort of legal structure what happens is you see a ton of wealth and resources flow to a specific company right um whether that's youtube in the case of we could say like the great IP land grab of 2002 to 2008 or whatever, or if that's going to be open AI with its deal with Microsoft and just thinking about like, and maybe there is a thing I think about historical change in all of this, right? Which is that there's moments of, of possibility and, and change. And there's moments of like where systems are, are more firmly established, you know? And I think that that everyone everyone who's listening to this like as certainly like if you look around the world it does feel like <laughs> one moment is ending and a new moment is coming in a very real sense and sure it's been feeling like that for a while but like all kinds of new things are popping up and really new things um, and so there is a question about like the kinds of structures you know the small contingencies and decisions and the kinds of structures that get baked into things now. I think we could be living with them for a really long time. And so in, in some ways that, that I think this interview, maybe to, to wrap things up, this interview made me think a lot about both the system that we have now, but also kind of the, how we got there and maybe doesn't give me like a, a like a direct sense of what's coming next as much as it may be, maybe by like analogy, you know, that, Whatever happens next, there is going to be a similar kind of like, you know, temporary <laughs> removal of rules followed by a slow restructuring process um, and being attentive to the way that certain groups ended up with like <laughs> a pretty big slice of the pie the first time might be useful if we want to try to figure out, I don't know, how to have a something like, a, I don't know, like a more equitable future. <laughs> <laughs> don't count out folks <laughs> and on that cheery note we're gonna move on to the interview with Kristen robinson from billboard but please rate and review us follow us on twitter subscribe to our newsletter enjoy the interview with Kristen robinson of billboard
Okay, so um, we're really excited to have with us today Kristen Robinson, who is the music publishing reporter at Billboard magazine, the venerable magazine of all things music industry and entertainment um, <laughs> forever, uh, yeah. and continues to do like very much the Lord's work in giving any insight into this like tangled web that is woven. Um, <laughs> and thank you. Yeah, yeah. Welcome, welcome to Money for Nothing. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here and talk about this stuff. I'm quite obsessed. Yeah, and this stuff that we're talking about today is going to be <laughs> the on light, online rights management and copyright infringement dynamics in the modern music industry, <laughs> more or less. Very sexy co- concept here today, <laughs> but... It really can be quite fascinating, I promise. I mean, the kids are asking for more content covering this area. So, (laughs) like, it's all over TikTok, you know. uh, So, I guess, um, really, uh, I reached out to invite you on the show because you were, my understanding is you kind of got into this rabbit hole as a result of breaking a really fantastic and and a horrifying story about probably the biggest, I don't know if it's the biggest YouTube theft of all time, but a massive copyright infringement theft. And so I thought that was a good place to start. And if you could maybe maybe Mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about this insane story. Yeah, yeah. So like you said, it's one of the biggest YouTube royalty thefts of all time. To be honest, I don't think there are that many people that are covering YouTube royalty thefts. So it's kind of hard to know. I I would say based on everything that I've researched, which has really taken a lot of time, this is the biggest I've ever seen. Um, But, you know, I obviously can't say that um, objectively it is the biggest because there's it's all also very possible that no one knows that some something even bigger has happened um sure so i want to leave room for that possibility and uh definitely will report on it if i ever find something bigger but yeah to explain that story um i worked on it for about six months um and it's all about these two guys, Jose Tedon and Webster Batista Fernandez, um, they both worked in uh, Arizona, Phoenix, Arizona's Latin music scene, which, you know, if you're not familiar, I, I wasn't before this story, but they do have a, quite a thriving but very local music industry there, um, mostly servicing uh, the Latin music community that lives there. And these guys both worked you know, among all the people there, they were like Webster was a music video director for a lot of local artists. And Jose was working at, you know, he owned a studio. Um, so they were around, mm-hmm. but they started working um, on this new project called Media Move, which they ultimately, according to the indictment, and also um, Webster, one of the two guys, has pled guilty, according to his plea agreement as well. They kind of started Media Move and decided to start pretending to represent a number of Latin artists and claiming the royalties for their music on YouTube, pretending that they're essentially like a label or a publisher or otherwise like a rights holder that is representing them. Um, And over the course of four years of doing this, they made $23 million and, you know, they had some co-conspirators those people have not been charged with any crimes and some of them are unknown still. Um, but that is kind of the gist of the story. Uh, just kind of taking advantage of some loopholes in YouTube system to go ahead and claim songs that they, uh, I mean, according to Webster did not have any right to, uh, but Jose is still maintaining his innocence and he will be on trial in Arizona for these crimes. Um, they were charged with 30 counts of wire fraud, money laundering, conspiracy, aggravated identity theft, all that jazz. And he will be on trial next month. So stay tuned. And so just to like break down, because it's such an amazing story because it gets, it's like a perfect window into the incredibly weird and rickety system that determines how 
the vast amount of money that flows or vast amounts of the vast amounts of money that flow through the digital musical ecosystem, how like those pipes mm-hmm. actually connect. So just to be clear, like how did they <laughs> claim these songs as their own? Who did they write to? Did they write to YouTube? Yeah. So according to some of the court documents, it seems that they got access to um, YouTube's kind of back end system, which is called the content management system or CMS. So they obtained access to the system. There are a lot of people who have access to the system. Labels and publishers all have this access. Other large rights holders or large creators on YouTube can apply um, to obtain this access, but not every user and every songwriter and every artist has access to this. Um, I would say that most songwriters and artists don't, um, but they ended up getting a um, the access to this back end. And from there, they started noticing that there were songs from Latin artists that were not properly claimed. And you, when you have access to the CMS, it there are definitely varying levels of how much access you get based on how much YouTube determines they feel you need access to their CMS. Um, but from my understanding of this, uh, they started noticing that there was there was some Latin music where the metadata for these songs was not properly recorded. So maybe the song is 10 years old. And when it was uploaded to YouTube, they never input who the songwriters' names were. And so it was just wide open. Stuff like that um, happens actually a lot. Um, I think all of these different songs, because they ended up claiming over 50,000 copyrights, um, which is crazy. I'm sure each of them was a case-by-case basis. But for the most part, I, I believe that there were probably issues in the metadata of a lot of these songs, leaving them just kind of open and up for grabs. Um, These artists might not have been making money on these songs anyway, because they didn't even realize that their rights weren't all situated. Um, So it was kind of a crime of opportunity, it seems. Yeah. And this is like, so, and this is what's crazy, I guess. So a lot of this comes down to the idea of um, that YouTube, is it, safe harbor right that youtube is a service and that users upload things to youtube and that youtube is not responsible exactly for copyright infringement when people upload stuff so instead what they've developed is a system where people kind of upload whatever they want and if the rights holders catch them through this content id system Either they get asked to take it down mm-hmm. or they redirect the money I guess, through an intermediary company, um, which in this case is AdRev, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then lands in the pocket, ideally, of the actual rights holder or in many cases the record labels that, you know, have the rights from the original. I mean, I guess those are the actual quote unquote actual right holder, yeah. but actually often have the rights instead of the artists who produce the music. But in this case, ended up in the pockets of these two gentlemen and they're like lime green Ferrari? Yeah. Lamborghini. Yeah. Oh, excuse I mean, me, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, it's 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 an interesting case. Um this I really does happen, I think, more than people realize. And this is mostly because metadata errors, like forgetting to put in songwriters' names or releasing a song before you have the splits situated so you don't even know who you are going to pay yet, or even just misspelling someone's name. These things happen a lot, which means that kind of these digital platforms, whether it's YouTube or otherwise, um, they don't know who to route the money to. If your name is misspelled in it, or if there's like three different Kristen Robinsons, let's say, that have songs on YouTube, How do they know who to pay between those three if you never really specified it? The problem is that most songwriters and artists don't really have access to a CMS where they could really check up and make sure that their rights are situated. So if you're an independent artist and you don't have access to CMS, for example, you might not realize that anything is wrong and that your money is getting kind of clogged up. Um, I think one of the biggest things that artists are going to be facing in the coming decades 
in this digital music business that we exist in now is more and more artists and songwriters are opting to stay independent for longer, which is a beautiful thing in so many ways. It gives them so much more control. But at the same time, as a songwriter or an artist, you're expected to be policing every single digital platform where you could be making money. And it's really hard to do that. And it requires a lot more of your time. And, you know, as we know, like a lot of artists just got into this because they want to make music. They don't want to be checking up on every single platform every few days and making sure that all their money is getting to them correctly. Um, Because, you know, I think there's an increasing number of songs that are going viral and doing well that are coming from artists that are independent with no one who can really help them check up on this stuff constantly. There are a lot of songs out there that are kind of just like floating in limbo. That being said, even if you do have a label, sometimes these labels, like if you think about how many copyrights Universal Music Group or Sony or Warner, whoever it is, have that they need to be checking up on on all of these digital platforms, it's really hard to have the right amount of staff to make sure you're really able to check on every single issue. It's it's a t- it's a huge undertaking. Now that the onus is placed on the copyright owner to make sure that they're getting paid and to police what's going on on every service, uh, it really has added a gigantic burden. But I mean, you could say in another sense that it's great that the onus is placed on them because they have more control. They can be the ones to check up on things themselves. But it's it's kind of it's an issue that goes beyond YouTube, and people have varying ideas about what we can do to make this better or um, how they feel about it. But yeah, it can be very complicated, and a lot of money can kind of get lost in the shuffle. Yeah. So I want to I want to come back to the idea that it's on the copyright holders to like deal with these to deal with the like rights management in a second. But mm-hmm. first, I want to go back to this insane case because they did a lot Mm. of you know crimes of opportunity crimes and or alleged crimes of opportunity um giving like the justice system the the chance to to work its work its magic but also the two men either via guilty plea or allegedly claimed rights that were like basically grabbed rights that were being claimed by other artists too right like that's how they eventually got caught? Um, so they eventually got caught in ways that I, I don't really think anyone knows how it started, but some people started to notice who who did have good teams behind them that were really being diligent, started to notice that this same unknown company kept trying to take control over their royalty streams on YouTube and started to alert um, AdRev, who, which was a company that Media Move hired to kind of help them with this process or YouTube itself or, or the media move team saying like, we don't know why you're claiming this. We've never heard of you before. You're not on the artist team. So I think that's like kind of where it started. And people had been calling this out to various people in those parties uh, since I believe early 2018. Um, But the, the stuff, uh, this didn't stop until 2021 um, I, I don't know how long the IRS was investigating them, but ultimately the IRS uh, did uncover quite a bit of detail about this and an indictment was filed against both Webster Batista Fernandez and Jose Tehran for 30 counts of wire fraud, conspiracy, money laundering, and aggravated identity theft. Interestingly, copyright infringement was not included in those crimes. Wild copyright infringement wasn't included i you know what i actually don't exactly know why you know i talked to quite a few people about that and various people had different ideas about why that might be but this is you know pretty uh, again these are all uh, there's been no sentencing for webster and the trial is going to take place next month for jose but this seems to be more of a fraud case than it is a copyright infringement case so, like, one of the things I keep thinking about with all of this is this kind of, like, a sliding scale that I use a lot when thinking about the music industry, which is, like, uh, is, is it inefficiency or is it malice? <laughs> and because it, it's often a mixture of both. Mm. And it just blows my mind that 
despite years of complaints about this company, you said in the article you wrote that you found whole websites and YouTube videos devoted kind of to, to bemoaning the f- from the artists whose rights had been stolen, bemoaning the fact that they were unable to get in touch with anyone who could do anything about this blatant yeah. theft of money that belonged to them, theft that was going through an alphabet company, right? Like one of the single most valuable most profitable tech companies in the world and that they were unable to get any kind of response from this like Byzantine opacity. And I guess it never even ever really got fixed. It only stopped because the IRS Mm -hmm. stepped in for wire fraud. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that we do have to remember that the scale of YouTube's offerings is crazy. Right. I think all of these digital platforms would fall into this category, but YouTube probably has more content because they, you know, have their video service, they have their short form video service, they have um, YouTube music, they have so many offerings. You know, it's it's something to debate if these digital companies, these platforms have taken on too much, but um, they have so much content that they're monitoring, even though there were people from pretty much the beginning of this alleged fraud that were calling it out. Mm-hmm. It's not super surprising to me that it was not something that was flagged and removed sooner. I feel like it's so easy for these things to slip through the cracks or, you know, it's just in a user generated content world, it's really hard to moderate. And I know that, uh, I think the platform's hands are pretty tied about what they can and can't do Mm -hmm. of removing profiles or removing videos. But yeah, it, it is very interesting that when I started looking into this, I realized that, oh, I'm not like, the first one to discover this and the IRS wasn't, you know, the first to discover this. This is something that many users have been calling out for years since the very start of it. And it just kept going. And you could even find YouTube videos on YouTube about people saying that this was, you know, that their royalties were being stolen from them from some random company called Media Move that they'd never heard of. Um, it's quite interesting to know that it, it really did date back to the beginning. Yeah. And I mean, I think that not to cast any aspersions, but also that this is a primarily Spanish language uh, music ecosystem, mm-hmm. that it's uh, in, in a regional, primarily Mexican-American or Mexican music industry that has a complicated relationship to the kind of the mainstream of the American music industry. I don't think it's any any coincidence that it's happening there and not, you know, they didn't claim like Justin Bieber's copyrights. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but they did claim like Daddy Yankee, which was really surprising to me. You know, they did claim some gigantic artists who are represented by global record labels and global publishers. That being said, like I I would say probably if you were to look at all 50,000 copyrights that they were claiming, I, I saw a list of some. I didn't see all of them, but a lot of them are going to be from these regional acts who did quite well in maybe a local market. And so there is a little bit of money to be made here and there because their videos stream well and they do have an audience. It's not gigantic. It's not Justin Bieber or Daddy Yankee level, but it's big. Um, And the thing is when, I I think that it's likely that the majority of victims of this were people who were signed to either local record labels and publishers or not signed at all. And you know, frankly, if I were to pull a lot of my friends who are making music right now and who are unsigned, if they know that they should maybe hire a rights management company to check up on their YouTube videos to make sure that they're claiming properly, I think they would be kind of surprised to hear that. I don't think that too many independent DIY artists really realize that you should be looking into these things um, consistently. So I, I would just say that I think it's Uh, A lot of people who were signed to smaller companies that might not be aware of the fact that this can happen or they weren't signed at all. Um, But yeah, that's I I talked to one of the managers who represented a victim of this, and he said that he wasn't super surprised that it was, um, you know, his artists and other um, artists in the Latin music scene that were mostly signed to these regional labels because he just wasn't 
aware and his team wasn't aware that they should be looking for this. Um, whereas I feel like it is harder to get past maybe a, a global company that might be more familiar with this kind of fraud, but it still happens. Um, like I said, there were quite a few major recording artists and that were targeted. The thing though, that, that is really fascinating about this all. Uh, let me take that again. Yeah, no, that that's fascinating that they're able to hit this wide variety of folks, but there is something to me that's really interesting and kind of topsy turvy about something you said there, which is that it, it's kind of, it's on the rights holders. It's on the musicians to check and see if their rights are being infringed on a platform like YouTube and like not mm-hmm. at all <laughs> this multi, multi, multi billion dollar company's responsibility to make sure that it's not, not just aiding and abetting you know, not just enabling copyright infringement, but actively selling advertising against it. Yeah, yeah. Someone someone actually brought up to me when I was having conversations before this story came out, someone mentioned to me the advertising component of this, which I thought was very interesting and something I hadn't thought about. Um, but yeah, that honestly, this is the way that the digital music industry is set up on. I think in general moving over to digital, moving over to the internet uh, has been really interesting in regards to copyright enforcement because copyright essentially is like the privatization of something, being able to have a monopoly over your idea, whether that's a song or whether that's a book you wrote. But on the internet, which is ruled by user-generated content or you know, by people answering questions freely on on Reddit or they're writing blog posts for free. It, it's very much so an open thing where we're all trying to mm-hmm. share information and share ideas openly. Um, and most people are not getting compensated for that. And they're okay with that. They're just participating in the internet ecosystem. When you enter copyright into a system like that, it becomes like kind of checking for needles in the haystack to try to find like where, where your song is ended up it could end up anywhere and it's it's so hard to police that and try to figure out where you should be enforcing your right your private you know thing that you own that you, it's it's hard to know when to enforce that you want to be paid for that and how to get in touch with the right people to get paid for that and as a consequence it's just it's kind of a, a mess overall and not just youtube i would just say in general it's just very difficult as a copyright owner to enforce your ownership over a song or any sort of intellectual property, you know, in a user generated content world. Yeah. Um, but there's also this really interesting tension there. Cause I, I totally, I totally see your description of this, um, like you said, a user generated content world, but like we also, you know, there's been a lot of talk in the last couple of years about tech monopolies. Right. So there's this funny bifurcation, which is this, you know, the vast flattening produced by the internet, but also the fact that this vast flattening runs through a really small number of companies. You know, there's millions of, of, of people uploading videos to YouTube, right? But like, there's only YouTube, really, for video sharing. And, you know, with all of the AI <laughs> in literally in the world. <laughs> um, and, and it strikes me as something that if a company like Alphabet really wanted to fix this, they they could make it, they probably could, or at least they could make it easier. Um, like this is not a company, you know, it's not, it's not 2004 where there's 10,000 blogs all popping up on different hosting services. Okay. It's like there's one place for music videos. It's YouTube. It's a really difficult problem, right? Like what are you going to do? Have everyone just upload only designated people upload their things yeah. which then makes youtube the gatekeeper for all music online and does destroy a huge amount of economic value and things don't go viral in the same way and certainly then the major labels like really 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 run the show like that's not what people that's not doesn't seem like the solution either yeah yeah so i i do think it's a really tough problem because i think the genie's like out of the bottle like we've all gotten so used to 
the democratization that the internet has provided to us. We all get to have a voice now, totally. which in many ways is wonderful. I could go and make a YouTube video or a TikTok or a blog post right now and reach so many people. Whereas before the internet, I, I wouldn't be able to have such a reach. It's wonderful that we're all sharing. And I think it's beautiful also that so many people are inspired by copyrighted material like music to make new things. I think if you were to look up on YouTube, um, you know, dances to Baby by Justin Bieber, just to keep using Justin Bieber, sure. you'd find example. a lot of like great creativity out of that. And that's amazing. But the scale at which it is a massive undertaking to try to police a platform when everyone, including both of us, are making an unprecedented amount of content that is only getting bigger every day, every week, every year. I don't know how many people, like, uh, we're, we're still at a place where we need people also to be policing this. I know there are some, you know, AI powered tools that are helping police all of these digital platforms for offenses like copyright infringement or fraud. Um, but it still requires to this day, a lot of manpower and, I, I'm not sure if there is a right answer to how how many people need to be employed to be policing these systems or if it's ever a problem that we could fix. Um, you know, obviously, I think there are always ways we could be doing better, ways that these platforms could take more responsibility. Um, but it is kind of like a game of whack-a-mole. Someone described this, you know, content policing as kind of a game of whack-a-mole. So... I think we're going to see this become an even bigger issue as the rate of creation is even greater sped up in the coming years using artificial intelligence. Yeah, totally. um, so I, I don't know, it kind of gets a little mind boggling to think about the scale of the issue and um, to kind of think about, is it even possible to fix it? But isn't it worth a shot? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no. And, and it's also tricky because... Like, I, I totally see what you mean. And, and it's like, it is really an almost incredibly intractable, intractable problem. But it's also like, certainly like YouTube makes a ton of money on the fact that you can find any piece of music in the world on there. Like, even even like the other videos on YouTube, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Get more valuable because if there was a, if there was no music on YouTube, I would go to YouTube and then like click over to like, I don't know, comedian videos next to the music video I was looking for or whatever, mm -hmm. right? Like just having this bulk amount of material on YouTube is obviously really good for YouTube, but like how to get any of that money back to the people who are making, whose, you know, life and experiences and sweat and time goes into making these products it's really difficult, though it's also important to say, just to muddle this even further, that like, if you look at the history of the 20th century music industry, the rights holders are often not musicians, the musicians, no. right? Like, they're often record mm -hmm. labels, who I, I guess have a better claim to those rights than the musicians, but like, a lot of time are signing young, inexperienced artists to multi-record deals and than keeping their stuff in perpetuity. Like, it's a yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a huge issue. And I, I think it's kind of the biggest issue of our time is trying to sort out how we reconcile music, the ownership of music and the enforcement of copyright and how the internet works. And, you know, I, I think it's, it, it's truly in every platform issue it's across mm -hmm. the board, but yeah, you're right. The, the platforms do benefit from having the music, which is a large part of the content. So I think that YouTube specifically over the years has really seemed to try to do a lot of outreach to the music business to try to make sure that they're in good standing um, with the music business. But um, yeah, it's with, I, I don't even know how many videos are on YouTube or uploaded every day, but the number is staggering. So trying to keep track of all that stuff is, is a lot. <laughs> um, just, you know, as we wrap up, just to take you, you know, take both of us really out of the comfort zone of like, 
the present <laughs> and into the the true speculation of the future. A recent in, in a recent episode, we started talking through the potential implications of AI music, which seems like, given recent ex- advances, is coming really soon to a streaming service near you if it is not already there mm-hmm. um, lurking in mood playlists. And, and so I was really interested to hear, you know, as someone who really understands these copyright systems, if you'd be willing to just to think out loud in a speculative sense about like what the impact of these technologies might be both, you know, in terms of like further muddying the waters of any kind of copyright yeah. claim. Yeah. But also like of like the, I mean, if you'd be willing to speculate on what it seems to me to be like the very real copyright test cases that are coming about models trained on specific bodies of artists' work. Yeah, I think that this is going to be a huge re- revolution in you know our lifetimes. I don't have any doubt about that. And so it's it's been very important to me to kind of read up and to connect with some of these music AI companies and try to learn from them about what their plans are and what this might mean. I would say that the the biggest thing that I think will be difficult to grapple with um, is the scale. A lot of these companies are not just trying to make music that will be entirely AI created. I, certainly there are some who are trying to make, you know, lo-fi beats so that maybe a lo-fi beats playlist on Spotify can actually have quickly AI generated um, lo-fi beats. But in general, a lot of these companies are trying to use <laughs> generative AI to help musicians write faster or help novices write better songs. Mm-hmm. And so if we think about, we've already experienced the trend towards everyone trying music out, obviously not everyone, but there's tons of people who probably pre-digital wouldn't have tried to make an album and put it out are trying that now because they have access to technology that can help them do it from the comfort of their home. And it sounds pretty good. And, you know, in many ways you could say that's a great thing. I think it's great that more and more people are excited by the music making process and the barrier of entry is lowered so that people maybe who don't have the financial resources to rent a nice fancy studio to make a studio quality album can do it at home. That's great. These generative AI tools, I think, are kind of the next generation of that, where it's going to potentially help you create a beat which you write on top of or make the entire instrumental which you're writing on or help you write your melodies or help you write your lyrics. That means that if it becomes something that a lot of people start using, it's going to be quicker music creation and output than ever. And as a consequence of that, you know, there's going to be a lot of music floating out there that maybe people aren't really looking after. Mm-hmm. Like I, I can even speak from experience. Um, when I was in college, I released some music and I'm proud of that music. It's not like I made a ton of money or anything, but I put out that music. But at the time when I did that, I didn't really realize how important it is to make sure that you're keeping track of it and to make sure that like I mentioned before, the metadata is correct. So the ISRC code and the spelling of your name and making sure that all the songwriters are listed on every platform so that they're getting paid properly and on time. Because of that, I I actually don't know. There might be a little bit of money here and there that's floating around on my own music that I don't even know about. If we think about, and like I'm someone who went to school for music business and I work at Billboard and I still don't know if there's any (laughs) money out there that I didn't ever collect. So if we think about that times a million or a hundred million or a billion. billion. Yeah, exactly. So if you're a DIY artist who's giving it a shot and you are writing on top of a beat that was generated for you by some sort of AI company, you create something and you want to put it out on Spotify. That's amazing. I'm happy for you. But I'm nervous by the scale of money that is owed that will never reach the proper destination because these artists are so DIY. We used to live in a system where, and I'm not saying this is necessarily better, but we used to exist in a system where if you wanted to be an artist that put out music, you needed to 
be signed to some kind of label or be able to physically press yes. heavy pieces of plastic and get them to stores. Yeah. yeah. So now that we don't need that, that there's just going to be more and more DIY artists and maybe a lot of them are going to end up being hobbyists like me that tried it and decided to move on and they don't really care about the money, but that money, if they got a significant number of streams, there is money out there. Where is it going? Because I don't think I necessarily received all of it. Not that it's much. There might be $100 floating around somewhere. But, you know, that has to go somewhere. So um, I, I think that when I think about AI, I just kind of think about the scale of DIY music production and what that will mean for royalty collection, how that will make things a lot more complicated. So, yeah. That's that's the main thing I've been thinking about. No, that makes a lot of sense. And certainly, I mean, it's going to be interesting to see it impact different like um, parts of the music industry differently. I mean, you know, because what you were saying totally makes sense. Though, on the other hand, we know that like at least right now, you know, a relatively limited number of, let's say, thinking about like Spotify data, a relatively limited number of artists on Spotify account for a disproportionate number of the total streams. Yes only some of which will probably be AI. I mean, I also wonder about like along those lines of like money getting the proper place is that, you know, Despacito break blows up and I'm a, I don't know, something really corny of a tequila company. And I want a song that sounds a lot like Despacito, but I do not want to pay anyone involved in Despacito. Like that, that kind of like, uh, Hitting those centers where the music industry makes a lot of money. Yeah. Those kind of uh, tangential, those kind of like edges of the where, where the music industry intersects with the kind of selling other stuff that's honestly like always been a huge part of its of its um Yeah, I think the economic engine. We're still a ways off of the music from generative AI being good enough to be a proper replacement for a really great song. Um, and I do think that there will always be needs where you know maybe that commercial like all hinges on the song despacito and its lyrics you know you can't really get a replacement for something that is truly meant for the commercial but i do think where it starts mm -hmm. and it already has started there's a few companies that are working on generative ai that can replace kind of like that stock like production music that you hear in the background of actually like uh -huh. youtube videos or podcasts um stuff like that where you just need kind of a pretty simple beat, nothing too intense. I think that's where it starts. And people are people are making pretty decent stuff now on that in that space, which does lower the costs for sure. a podcaster that's looking for a theme song or a YouTuber who's looking for background music. Obviously, people are also working towards emulating other artists. And that gets really scary when it comes to copyright law. If you think about copyright law, again, as, you know, your ownership, the, the privatization of your intellectual property of your idea, it's a really tough thing to reconcile that being the system that the music business is based on mm -hmm. and AI music production in the future. I think it's going to be the continuation of this same theme of it just being really difficult to keep track and to enforce. Um, and this, the scale keeps getting bigger. So I think we are still a few years off of something being able to be an apt replacement for a major song in a commercial, but I wouldn't say that it's impossible for that to happen. I don't know what the timeline is for how how long it will take for an amazingly good I don't think generative anyone AI does. engine to come about. But I'm sure it'll be within my lifetime. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that, I mean, that's one of the main questions of all of this, right? Like, you know, the time scale of, is it two years? Is it 10 years? Is it 25 mm -hmm. years? And I think we don't know, but like all signs point to sooner rather than later, given if you, what feels like recent advancements. Yeah, I would say it's sooner rather than later. I think this is the time right now for the music business to start building out what they think is the best way to enforce their ownership in this oncoming age and how they want to deal with AI and whether or not they, I, I, I don't know. I think this is the time to sort out the ethical questions before it all comes true. 
in a real way. Sure. I hope that people are having those conversations at every company. I know some are. Um, there certainly are companies that are already looking to either invest or kind of create parameters around what they feel is ethical and unethical uses of AI. Um, but, you know, these, I think it's going to be, frankly, as a reporter, it'll be interesting, scary, sad, maybe happy, you know, like to watch as things transform. It'll certainly be interesting. Nonetheless, we yeah. are entering into, I think we're on the cusp of like kind of the next phase. Um, so fingers crossed. <laughs>